Hi everyone, this is Andrew Primer, the Ukrainian-American, reporting from Kyiv. In today's podcast, this is week 135 of Russian invasion of Ukraine. This is the first week of October 2024. So in today's podcast, after two and a half years of defense, Ukraine lost the Vuhlidar town in the Donetsk region. We're also going to talk about Will Ukraine become a NATO member and how realistic it is, is it? And, and, and finally, does actually the U.S. want Ukraine to be a NATO, NATO member? The fall of Vuhlidar city in the Donetsk region was painful, but not decisive in the war to some extent. Military analysts are praising the fall of Vuhlidar a coal mining town in Ukraine's eastern Donetsk region as a painful setback for Ukrainian forces, but one but one that is unlikely to change the course of the war. Ukraine's Eastern Military Command said on Wednesday last week that it had ordered its troops to withdraw from Vuhlidar to avoid being encircled by Russian troops and to preserve personnel and military equipment. Russian forces had besieged the town since Moscow launched its full-scale invasion in February 2022. On Thursday, the commander of Ukraine Armed Forces, General Alexander Sirsky, said he had ordered defenses of the Donetsk region to be strengthened. Ukrainian and even Russian experts said that while Vuhlidar's fall would complicate the position of the Ukrainian armed forces in their fight against the Russian invasion, it would not lead to an imminent collapse of Ukraine's defense lines in eastern Ukraine. The town of Vuhlidar, which had a population of about 15,000 people before Russia's invasion in February 2022, is located on a hill, which gave Ukrainian forces a strategic advantage for a long time, allowing them to bombard Russian troops and supply lines. Russian forces have suffered heavy losses of manpower and equipment during numerous assaults launched against Vukhledar since 2022. Still, both Russian and Ukrainian experts said that the strategic loss of Vukhledar will, while painful, but did not radically transform the military situation in eastern Ukraine. On, tu- on Tuesday, as Vuhlidar's fall appeared imminent, the Washington-based institute the study of war wrote, some Russian sources expressed express doubts that Russian forces will be able to rapidly advance and achieve operationally significant breakthroughs immediately after sizing Vuhlidar. Some Russian military bloggers noted that they do not expect the front line to collapse following the seizure of Vuhlidar town, citing Ukrainian defense positions northeast of Vuhlidar and the need for Russian forces to completely clear Vuhlidar to make it a usable position from which they can launch future assaults. However, some Ukrainian military experts think that the loss of Vuhlidar is a defeat that will have serious strategic consequences. An important fortified area with a large number of equipped positions in minefield, was eventually lost. What is the meaning of the Vuhlidar? The defense of Vuhlidar is a huge achievement of Ukrainian soldiers who for two and a half years inflicted losses on the Russians uh, at Vuhlidar many times higher than ours and repelled two major offensives in 2022 and 2023. The city had a key position in controlling the southern flank of the Ukrainian defense forces in Donbass. It was an extremely advantageous advantageous position, a commanding height and densely built up, which gave the better reach for drones and firing positions for all types of weapons. What are the consequences? It was profitable to keep coal miners. The loss of Uglidar is a defeat that will have serious strategic consequences. An important fortified area with a large number of equipped positions and minefields needed to be recovered. After that, 
the enemy will collapse the front and advance on Velika Novosilka from the east on Kura, Kurakov village from the south, and there are so and there are no such convenient lines of defense there. It is necessary to immediately create a new line of defense to cover the borders of Dnipropetrovsk and Zaporizhia regions from the east. So, when it was necessary to withdraw the troops from Uglidar, was it timely or not? And what losses did Ukrainian soldiers suffer? The only route to the city of Uglidar, Vohoyavlinka, was taken under the fire controlled by the enemy on September 24. The occupiers moved to a distance of 1,400 meters, or approximately one mile, from the road. At this moment, the Ukrainian forces should have ordered a planned, organized withdrawal of troops from the city, since there was no strength to unblock the city. On September 26, the enemy completely closed the possibility of entering the city with drone strikes. Nevertheless, the Ukrainian commanders did not give a timely order to withdraw the troops, but asked to continue to hold them. On the night of September 30th to October 1st, the command of 72nd Brigade, on its own responsibility, withdrew the last cover units due to the impossibility of further defense which was carried out with losses to the, to the, to, due to dense enemy fire. During the last four days of the defense of Uglidar, the 72nd Brigade lost about 30 soldiers missing in the city and won the road of departure, on the road of departure. At one of the positions, the Russians captured five Ukrainian servicemen whose names have not been established yet and executed them on the spot, and the Ukrainian drone recording this act of genocide. So this week, the world leaders and Ukraine's allies will meet in the Rammstein format to discuss Ukraine's NATO membership. And as you heard, there have been multiple speculations about allowing Ukraine to start becoming a NATO starting process of acceptance of Ukraine into the NATO. Regarding the visit of the newly elected NATO Secretary General Mark Rutte to Kyiv, means that, that we have something new to look forward in the Ukraine NATO direction. Ukraine has been waiting for this exception since 2008, already 16 years. If our Western partners look at things not cynically and pragmatically, but intelligently and far-sightedly, many tragedies that were experienced together today would not would not wouldn't have happened. But the world is cynical, and everyone tries to protect their own interests in the first place. Unfortunately, Ukraine waited too long, and our Western partners thought about that too long. The leaders of the Western countries will gather at the end of the week for a meeting in the Rammstein format. Let's discuss a specific proposal model that can be heard by Ukraine. In the recent interviews, former NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg stated that Ukraine can become a member of the alliance even if it, not all of its territories are freed from occupation. Many people associate this with the fact that Rammstein will be held and Ukraine may, may receive such an offer at this meeting. First, President Zelensky will still take his victory plan to Rammstein and present it to all coalition members. This should be the first thing that Ukrainian delegation will do at the meeting. How it will be received in next is the next question. What is written in this peace plan is still a, a secret, so we can only guess on this topic. Again, Western partners are spending money at our expense to end the war that they also tried off. They must return to the fact that they can work with Russia, but its resources and buy its resources at a reasonably low prices and so on. Therefore, there is a certainly pressure on Ukraine. 
If the West allows, for example, Russia to cut to 20% of territory of a neighbor country and say, okay, this happened, well, that's how it will be, it's totally fine, well, then Moscow takes 50% of territory, for example, of Kazakhstan. And the Russian Federation, they're already talking about that the Kazakhstan is an artificial country and that the entire northern part is actually primarily Russian lands. Well, why not capture 80% of the territory of Georgia? Well, why it's only 25% of 30? Well, why not more? So that you know the appetite of the Putin's army and the Russian dictator is growing. That is, you can go infinite like this. For example, what will NATO do if three Russian divisions abruptly drop on the Baltic countries and take it over? They will say the same thing. Well, Baltic people, excuse me. Well, that's what happened. That's the reality. You will live by different rules now because today NATO cannot come up with an answer. Or are there any answers as, you know, how to protect the country? NATO doesn't have any capabilities to resolve this issue quickly or like in any other way. The alliance will spend three months as well, as usual thinking about how to lead this or that technique or come up with a technique to liberate the Baltic countries. And in three months, nothing will be left of the Baltics. Just look at the example of Ukraine and see what Russia did within a month or two with those cities. They were simply erased from the earth. Well, even if Ukraine is invited to the NATO, how quickly can Ukraine become a member of the alliance? The answer is very simple, not fast, because the procedures in the countries of the allies take months or years. So if the allies tell Ukraine during the Rammstein meeting, we would like to accept you in NATO and we are ready to start this process tomorrow. So unfortunately, it will take years. So what is going to happen to Ukraine during those years? Just look at the examples of other states was waiting for long becoming a NATO member. It took years, but this is a different situation. We are at war with Russia. And let's not forget um, another very important fact that we have Hungary and Slovakia that support Russia and do what Putin asked them to do. So, okay, there will be tools to, to put pressure on them, but it will still be done at the last moment and in a way that will drag out the process as much as possible. What are we going to be doing during the exception process? Do we keep fighting? Is the war still still beyond? How does this whole story unfold? On what legal grounds? And well, NATO has invited us. We are already in the process of joining, but the war continues. Does will not will NATO protect us or not? So unfortunately, there will be hundreds of questions and hundreds of questions that nobody knows how to answer. However, all these assumptions are good enough, but let's be honest with each other and state the fact that the U.S. doesn't really want Ukraine in the bloc, no matter what. From a practical point of view, the U.S. doesn't want, just as it didn't want to yesterday or until 2022, to undertake the specific obligations to defend the sovereignty of Ukraine with weapons in hands. In any border, without Crimea, without Donetsk, without Kyiv, or without Lviv, the issue is not about the borders. The issue is that the U.S. doesn't want to take on the obligations to fight for Ukraine under any conditions, as repeatedly officially announced in Washington. The U.S. simply doesn't want even the hypothetical possibility that they will be forced to fight for Ukraine. And that is why they're against Ukraine joining NATO. This is the main thing. Everything else is a speculation. The main goal of which is to cool the Western public and convince them that peace in Ukraine is easy and achievable tomorrow. This, in turn, should ensure and decrease in attention to Ukraine and its support. The Western mass media have been working 
in this mode for about two years. In the fall of 2022, after the liberation of Kherson, retired American General Mark Milley said that the time has come for negotiations and also to close the issue of partial membership in NATO. Slovak Prime Minister Robert Fico, while visiting Kyiv this week, promised to block Ukraine accession to NATO while he is in power. He declared that he would direct the deputies on whom he has political influence not to agree to Ukraine's membership in the alliance, citing the risk of the Third World War. Yes, although Slovakia has minimal military importance for NATO, it must ratify the membership of any country in the alliance. Doesn't want, doesn't ratify. And this will be an excellent formal re reason to block the to entry of, for example, Ukraine. Even if something in this direction is solemnly promised to her. It is possible to, is it possible to force Slovakia? Perhaps it is possible. The question is who will do it and how? Clearly, not the same people who blocked Ukraine's membership in NATO earlier. The NATO scheme, in which the US actually decides everything, and formally, the consensus of the bunch of states, some of which do not have real political weight, allows to effectively camouflage US policy for more than a decade. By the way, one more observation. The US has offered Israel a compensation package if it refrains from hitting certain targets in Iran. Israeli journalist Amishai Stein reported this, referring to reports received from the US officials. According to him, such a proposal was made during the negotiations regarding the response to Iran's attack. The package may include diplomatic protection and armaments. It turns out that completely empty American arsenals are not that empty. If, for example, it is necessary to persuade Israel to calm down a little to desire to take revenge on Iran, here it is essential to understand that the US knows very well that Israel can do something to Iran, and it's easier to try to redeem from Israel. The secret of success is very simple. To be so packed with military resources that it would be easy to pay off you than to try to squeeze you. If Ukraine had nuclear weapons, the US would give us as many missiles as, as possible and indicate any coordinates for these missiles because it would be easier than playing nuclear escalation. But the President Bush senior administration came up with an elegant scheme, nuclear weapons in exchange for commitments that no one would honor. I'm sure that even the, president, the presence of viable Ukraine ballistic missiles would make conversation with Americans much more meaningful and interesting. It is easy to blame the United States, right? Yes, it is. However, in my opinion, this is the fault of Ukrainian politicians over the last two or maybe three decades who sold all the rockets and weapons and tanks and fighter jets to Russia and other countries during, the, uh, during those two decades. U Ukraine had one of the largest weapon arsenals in the world in the late 90s and up to mid-2000s. Where is it? It was sold by corrupt Ukrainian politicians all over the world to make millions of dollars. And nobody thought about Ukraine at that time. Because Russia was friend. Even now, the ones who sold all these resources are enjoying the sun somewhere in Spain or Bahamas, drinking tequila and watching on TV how Ukrainians are killed as a result of their corrupted schemes. Unfortunately, that's the reality. But we do everything, and we want Ukraine to win this war. Thank you for listening. If you like my podcast, share with your friends.